Now, I think it's fair to say that sport comes in various forms, not least very extreme forms, and our next guest knows all about that. So ultra running, as I'm sure you're probably familiar with, is long distance running. What we're talking about here is certainly beyond the 26.2 miles that make up a marathon. A shortest distance generally considered as a distance between 50k or 31.7 uh, miles, 50 miles, 100 miles, 100k, these are the kind of distances we're talking about. And a form of ultra running is sky running where just to make things a bit more interesting and difficult, the incline exceeds 30%. And our next guest is an ultra runner, a sky runner, professional sky runner. And back in August of this year, she closed the book really on what was a two year saga, which very nearly resulted in death. So you have to be a bit crazy to do this is the other point. Hilary Allen is her name. She's from Fort Collins in Colorado. You're there, Hilary? I'm here, hello. Thanks for joining us. It's great to have you with us. And you do have to be a bit mad in some respects to do this. I don't know, is it for a sense of achievement? Is it a sense of escapism? Is it, frankly, a sense of boredom with the mundane aspects of day-to-day -day life? But uh, this is definitely beyond the comfort zone and then keep on going a bit more. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a combination of those three things you just listed. Um, I think it was also, uh, I was in graduate school when I first started um, running in general, but also ultra running. And so... I needed an escape and you know I was pretty stressed out I was studying I was getting a PhD in neuroscience and so I just like needed the space to kind of think um but yeah I mean I kind of discovered sky running by accident um and as an American runner it's actually it's pretty difficult because usually we we have a lot of rules where we run uh we're not really allowed to go off trail like you'll get a fine um and so I think I like that aspect so I was actually drawn more to the European trails and um that's where I kind of got into this extreme form of sky running. Um, I wouldn't really call myself a daredevil, so hmm. yeah. <laughs> so doing your, uh, doing your master's in neuroscience, obviously very academic, very demanding, as you say. I know you played a bit of tennis to a decent level in uh, college yeah. as well. So uh, like, had running been a thing for you before 2013? Did you know you had that bit more endurance maybe than the average person? Like, How does it suddenly come about that you go from playing a bit of tennis to doing <laughs> this kind of madness? Yeah. Also, maybe the bit of tennis, I was sick of them, like, telling me that I needed to wear a skirt all the time. So I maybe, you know, needed a little bit of a, you know, to break from the norm there. Um, but yeah, so I mean, running was always a form of conditioning. But in tennis, it's a form of, you know, you're sprinting uh, for short periods of time, like 15, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds. And mm. then um, you get a break. But these but matches can last for, you know, hours. Um so I actually had this crazy record in college that whenever it got to a third set, so best two out of three sets, uh, wins the match. And when it went to a third set, I never lost. Um, and I think that was like the first inkling that I kind of, I could just outlast my opponents. Um, but in fact, I kind of like hated the running portion of conditioning of tennis. <laughs> so, um, after college, uh, when it was kind of more, more and more difficult to find basically partners to play with. And um, yeah, just court time was expensive. Running was super simple. And so I kind of, I just started running as a way to just release things. And I happened to kind of meet people who started running trails and I just, yeah, I didn't want to run in the city. And so I was driving to the trails and then it just kind of took off from there. Mm. And you must realize <laughs> early on that you're good at it and that the win in the third set inkling was based on uh, something uh, of sure foundation because by 2015 yeah. you are a professional skyrunner you're good enough that i think it's north face will actually employ you to do this so that's that's quite the leap you know that shows that yeah. there was a talent for it yeah i think there definitely was i mean it took me a, a bit to actually compete in running because i um i got burnt out in tennis and i just didn't i just i got sick of it um and that the pressure associated with it and i was already super stressed out with graduate school but i did realize that there was a little bit of a talent there but what i really what drew me to running um and i think what drew me to um becoming a, a professional athlete so soon into actually just starting the sport was the fact that i could i could see progress like the harder i worked mm the better I became. And I'm someone who's super stubborn and I have a really hard work ethic and I really liked that. Mm. So I could just see if I kept on running more and more, um, like these races, I could, I think actually I won and set a course record for my first 50 mile race. So mm. then I kind of thought, I was like, oh, okay. I think I have a little bit of a knack for this. <laughs> 
and Hillary were family behind this. You know, they, their daughter goes up to, stu to study neuroscience, quite an impressive thing. I'm yeah. sure they're very proud. And then you turn around and say, I'm actually going to run around mountains, I think, instead. Did they, they kind of think this was a good idea? No, they didn't. Um, they actually weren't. I mean, OK, I love my parents, but I think that they were um, not so supportive at first. <laughs> um, uh, um, and actually, my father, he, he uh, so he he's this, he's from Scotland. He actually grew up in Isle of Skye. So he knows like what he he was surrounded by fell running and stuff like this. So I think, you know, he's seen like people break their femurs, like running down hills and stuff like this. But um he's a scientist as well. And so I think they, they were just maybe scared for my future because I've always been a very deliberate and like thought out person mm. and basically just kind of be like, Hey, I'm going to change paths completely and not go down this scientific career path. I'm going to go down a completely different one in the world of athletics. Um, I think they're more scared and apprehensive. Like they knew I'd figure it out, figure it out, but, mm. um, their support came later on, I think, okay. especially when, they saw the sponsors and um, that whole kind of thing. And now they travel to races to watch me race, so that's cool. Yeah, and now, because I want to get on to what happened then two years ago mm -hmm. next, but how do you explain the shift? Like if you're saying you were this fairly uh, resolute person and you picked a path and you tended to follow it. Like I understand uh, the thrill of running as a release from your studies and it definitely it must be quite um, uh, nice when you realize you're, you're good at it too, but it's a hell of a change. I mean, were you kind of looking at, yeah. at, at life and saying, oh, that all looks a bit boring or, or how do you explain the, the, the kind of serious enough shift in life direction? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I honestly think that I was in school for like 17 years, like literally from when I was a, a kindergartner, I wanted to get my PhD just cause my, my father had it. Um, and like I was surrounded by science. I loved science. Um, I just, yeah, I just, I just, I just wanted to go down this career path. And like I said, I'm a very diligent person thought yeah. out. Um, when I have a goal, I, I just work and work and work at it until I achieve it. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, it basically took a little bit of, um, convincing myself that it was okay to make this transition into the unknown. I mean, it literally took me, I basically tried to balance graduate school and running professionally, like traveling all over the world, especially to Europe to compete in these races that I was, you know, really good at. Um, I basically did that for a year trying to balance both. And I kind of weighed the pluses and minuses. And I just, I was like, I think basically I'm going to lose an opportunity. Like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to explore the world of athletics and what it means to be a professional athlete. And I just logically, I thought that like, I couldn't give that up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was a really cool way to just give myself permission to be creative um and and do something with uh, like not outside of the norm of what I've been used to doing it was quite scary at first um because it really had no like linear plan I was just mm. kind of like all right rolling the dice and seeing if this worked out but it's taught me a lot and it's taught me to be a lot more flexible um and yeah I mean it seems to have been working out so far yeah. <laughs> even with the, you know, the setback. <laughs> what we're going to yeah. talk about. <laughs> what, 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 what will you euphemistically call the setback? So, uh, yeah, the setback. <laughs> so, uh, so at this stage, you take the leap, and that's kind of an interesting thing because we're probably all fairly head down and furrowing our own little path without thinking too much about what other options there are. But you, you take that leap, and you go from 2013 taking up running to 2015 being a professional, and then at 5th of August 2017. Mm -hmm. You're 31 years of age. You go to Norway for the Tromso Sky Race. And I saw the organizer, Killian Jornet, of this race, uh, frankly said, to be honest, you do this race, you could die. So it's 57 kilometers long. It's located in the far north of Norway, and mountains rise very sharply off the coast. So in that sense, it has a special place. I, I read on the BBC website in Sky Running in that it's one of the truest forms because it goes from sea to summit, and you do trails and through forests and across snow and up summit. So it's, it's kind of a yeah. cool race. Um, where life changes for you is about halfway through. And I've seen the picture here, and it, it, was, it was funny, having seen the picture of where you fell from uh, makes things a whole lot more easy to understand. Now, for people listening on the radio, they won't see the picture. For people watching on YouTube or um, listening on our social channels, they'll see. It's effectively like a mini mountain uh, that you fell off. It's a narrow ridge. It's approaching a 1,400-metre summit in the distance. And this yeah. is, the, you know, the thing with sky running. You have to be concentrating at all times. This isn't just running on a flat road. Uh, so the stats on the fall, you free fall for 50 feet 
and then you tumble for another 100 feet. So we'll get yeah. into the, the, the fun of that in a second. Do you know how you, you, fall, you, you fall? Was it like a loss of concentration or did something give way or can you even remember? So, yeah, so, I mean, you mentioned it's, it's, it takes a lot of concentration to run these races. It's also something I really like about it because I am really feel like I'm at one with the trail. Like, mm. I get to use my hands and my feet, and I don't – I get to zone out in kind of a different way than the typical roadrunner would. Um, but I do – I remember everything leading up to the fall. Um, I was on the ridge. I remember, like, seeing my friends. I remember just feeling strong. I think I was, like, moving into third place at this point. Um uh, I remember even like scenes from the, from the Ridge. Um, but then what actually, um, but then it, but then it was just like a split second and I was airborne. Like the horizon was, um, like upside down. Like that's what the most vivid memory that I have. I was like, huh, like, okay, that's not supposed to be there. Um, <laughs> and then from there, it was just kind of like this realization, like life just slowed down and I was, um, I, I was free falling and I, I, I knew I was like, I knew it was happening. Like literally it was an outer body experience of my, my, basically my mind telling myself, like, I was like myself watching me as I fell, like you're dying, you're falling, like try to stop yourself. Like I remember the impacts. I don't remember the pain of them, but I remember like hitting the side of the mountain and then like that happening kind of on repeat as I was airborne and the horizon was spinning. Um, but to my best recollection, like it just happened in an instant. Usually, I mean, you fall on the trail. I've fallen on the trail before, not like this, but like you have an instant where you're like, oh shit, like I'm, ah, like I tripped and like I'm, I'm going to brace myself for a fall. Mm. That didn't happen. Um, so it was, I think basically what people, what some eyewitnesses said when, when I fell was that there were some rocks that were kind of launched as I fell. So, I mean, in Norway, it's super wet. Um, it's just notoriously kind of crumbly, chossy rock, um, even though like there's some granite, like granite peaks, but like those rocks are constantly moving. And so my best um, assumption is that I stepped on something which, you know, maybe some other people ahead of me had stepped on and it caused it to shift a little bit. And then with my certain body placement and, and movement, it kind of caused it to to fall. And that's kind of what um, yeah. it's a pretty like gnarly ridge. So you, you, you don't have room for error, even like a little trip. Mm. Um, yeah. To use like the worst ever comparison, but it's, it's the only thing really that most of us will have in our uh, general experience here is when we're kids and we jump off a wall, which is that bit too big for us maybe. And you get the sudden rush of like blood going to your head and whoom, and then you land. Um, yeah. you know, it all happens very quickly. It's, it's interesting. You, you almost felt like time slowed down and you used the phrase there. I thought I was going to die. Did you, did it cross your mind that this will, I'm about to die? Yeah. Like literally that was the, that was the, like the, just uh, the narrative in my head was that like, like literally it was like, Hill, you're dying. Like in this moment, like this is it. Um, does, does your life flash before you and all those cliches? No, it did not. Like life like slowed down for me. And like, I was just hyper aware of everything. Like I said, like I, my senses actually, I don't know if they just heightened or they dulled because like I said, I wasn't experiencing pain. Mm. I was just like, I was trying my best to survive in that moment, even like even though I was aware that like this might be this might be it. So at that point, I'm going to bring in um, Manu Parr. So Manu Parr is another competitor in the race. He's from Spain, but he lives in Tromso. And you, I think you had just overtaken him actually before you got to this uh, part of the ridge. And yeah. He says. He, Which is, I remember that. Like. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so he says, and I mean, here's a thing to imagine. He says the worst thing about it all, as he watched you fall, he said, was the sound. A human body bouncing against the rock. It was just awful. Mm -hmm. And then he, as I mean, it was, it was the right thing to do, but I guess it's worth saying fair play to him. He follows you down. You know, he, really, he tries to get down after you. It's a bit treacherous, but he does. And the amazing thing is, he says, I was sure that she was dead. I didn't even think to check her vitals. So, you, I mean, as far as he was concerned, you were just mangled and dead. It wasn't even a case of checking if you're alive, which is an extraordinary thing. Yeah. So, oh my goodness, Manu is just amazing. And, um, like I had just literally met him that day. Like I remembered, I remembered passing him. Um, and I remember like exchanging some like pleasantries and like, Hey, you're doing great. Cause we kind of going back and forth the whole race at this point. Mm. Um, but yeah, he's trained. He, he, he lives in Tromso. He's trained in mountain rescue. And so I think he just went into survival mode after seeing me fall. Cause he was behind me at this point and he scrambles down this ridge, which 
is like, you know, you think, oh, okay, like he scrambles down to me. Like what he did, like the ridge that he scrambled down after now that I've, that I've seen the place where I fell, uh, it's vertical. So it was, he was putting himself in great danger just to even like see if I was, you know, alive or okay. Um, but yeah, so like that was incredible, but like ex- what he, what he explained to me of how bad the accident was, um, it put it in perspective because I mean, I was there in a hospital bed, you know, thinking, okay, like, you know, I survived great, but like my injuries are catastrophic, but it was amazing that I wasn't dead after what he described, like my body position. He said, I just looked contorted, like a position that he's never seen a human body in before. Like my ribs were broken. And he said my, and my back was clearly broken. Just like the shape that my, that I was in on the side of the mountain. Mm. Um, and that really put it in perspective for me. Um, and like, he, he said he didn't even think twice that I was, that I was alive. Like he was just trying to like get me to a safe place. So I wouldn't keep falling to so that literally like the, the helicopter, which people had called so they could like evacuate my body off of the mountain. Like mm. he didn't think that I had survived. Yeah. And he said when he, so when he kind of realized, he, he said he saw your stomach moving and realized, oh my God, she's still yeah. alive. And he, he knew he had to move you because you were in a precarious position. But it, he said it, it was almost certain in his mind that you had spinal injuries. So he was very careful about moving you at all. Mm-hmm. The helicopter takes 25 minutes to arrive, but then I was reading that it takes you, it, does it take two hours to actually get you into the helicopter? It took me, so basically the, the, the helicopter ride from Tromso to where I was is probably about like 10 minutes. Um, so it took a total like two and a half hours okay. to basically get me to the hospital. But yes, um, the reason why uh, the helicopter was there relatively quickly, however, the helicopter can't land. It's hovering on this ridge line, which is then throwing down rocks like onto, you know, like near all the people that are down there with me, the doctor has to be hoisted and lowered onto the ridge line. He then has to find a safe way to scramble down to me with this cot. And then basically everyone else has to help. Um, there's a couple other people mm. down there at this point, like some photographers, um, uh, friends of mine. Um, and they all have to like hoist me on to the cot, you know, and then hoist me up onto the helicopter. So that whole operation took a a really long time. And I remember Manu saying to me that it was just, it was, it was excruciating just waiting there. Like, cause he was, he was holding wounds, uh, clothes that were bleeding like from my legs and from my head. Um, he said that there was a cut on my leg that he could fit his entire hand in sideways. Um, I still have a pretty gnarly scar from that, but, um, no kidding. but yeah, so it was a, uh, it was a pretty extensive operation and it's just a pretty, even though you're not so far away from the nearest city, it's a pretty remote yeah. and extreme location. And Hillary, when I go, when I, I ever have to go to the hospital and they say, give me the pain threshold between one and 10, I always say eight because why not get the painkillers? I mean, that's just, uh, you'd, be, <laughs> you'd be silly not to. So, uh, what, what were you on that one to 10 scale? Uh, blackout. So maybe <laughs> like an 11 <laughs> yeah. and I have a pretty high pain tolerance. Mm. So that's impressive. Um, yeah. And actually, I mean, I, this is funny, but like, I, I, I wanted to feel like at, I connected to my body and somehow. Yes. So after two weeks I stopped taking the pain meds. <laughs> well, like, I guess when you, when you regain consciousness, one of the first things I think if any of us are in that moment, can I feel my legs? Yeah. That's the narrative. And that literally the rest of operation, I was saying like, oh my God, I'm still dying. And I literally remember thinking, um, because the pain would just come in waves at this mm. point, like it would literally knock me out because I just couldn't take it. Mm. Um, and I'd scream, but then I could see myself like pain. I couldn't tell where the pain was coming from, but I could see myself kicking my legs. And then in my mind, I was thinking like, okay, that's a good sign. Uh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Cause even psychologically, if you'd had to be there for two hours, not able to feel or move your legs, I mean, that would have been just horrific. So yeah. They get you to the hospital. Uh, we're talking, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm reading this, uh, 12 broken bones, including two broken bones in your back. Both arms are broken. Uh, we're talking literally hundreds of stitches. And then over the yeah. next two weeks, you have five operations in two weeks and you're told you probably will never run again. So that is no fun. You were in a seriously bad way. Yeah. Um, I think maybe it was like 14, you know, but who's counting? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like a couple extra bones in my feet which you know you need those um but yeah it was actually the end the first time i've ever broken a bone so i went all out wow um <laughs> so like 
uh, and you're told you'd probably never run again. I mean, for starters, I don't know if you ever like do it, God, I never want to run again. And um, the, the, the recovery, like, it, it's kind of relatively uh, quick, you know, in, in in many ways because. Uh, within six months, you could kind of run again. Three months, you could walk again. So that, that makes it sound like it was relatively smooth and not so bad. What, what were those six months like? Um, to me, it did not feel very fast. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so six, I mean, yeah, I guess it was. I guess you know, if I look back at it, it does seem very fast because um, actually the first three months, I couldn't even walk. I was on a scooter. Like, I could not, I, I ruptured a major ligament in my foot. That was one of the surgeries I had. And it was like literally the doctor, um, she came in and she's like, this is a foot changing injury. Like, literally, I want to tell you that you will, you will never compete at running again. Like, this is that serious of an injury. Like, you might, you might jog. But like, she's like running is, she's like, I think running is off the table. Like mm. it's, you're not going to do it. Mm. And so I was non weight bearing for, for three months. And so then like, I would start, I kind of, you know, I, I, I tried to cycle. I mean, even that's like partial weight bearing. So I was pretty careful. And then like, I would start hiking and then, um, like my first run, which was like six months in was like a jog. Um, like it was like a, a run walk, mm. um, and I remember those first steps were terrifying. Like I, I literally in my, in my brain, I was on like a flat path in, in my brain, I was going through my head, like, don't fall, don't mm. fall, don't fall. Cause my body like remembered what had happened the last time I did that motion. Um, but I mean, it, it's so hard to sum up what recovery is like, because even once I started running, it's been like this whole saga for like for two years. And, um, sometimes even, if, even now, um, but like just the emotional like depths and lows that you go to. I mean, it was, it was quite, it was, it was quite extreme. Like I'm not, I'm a very happy and optimistic person. Um, but there are times where I just wish that it would like the accident would have killed me because it just felt easier than to have to deal with like the pain each day and like, and, and the struggles each day that I face just even early on in my recovery to like brush my teeth or like bathe myself or eat. Mm. Um, and then to have this thing that I loved stripped away from me. Um, I almost felt like a, a sense of my identity was gone. And that's a really hard thing to face day in and day out. Mm. Um, but it's also what kept me going and to kept me showing up and doing these little things each day to, to kind of hopefully piece, piece my way back to running one day. That's kind of how I thought about it. Mm. Cause kind of miraculously, um, within six, you're running again. Within 10, you've entered your first sky race, sky race uh, since the accident. That was in June 2018. And then the week after, there was a 48-kilometer 48, yeah. 48 race, which you enter in northern Italy, and you win. So that's just <laughs> nuts, you know. Like, uh, if anyone in our office tried to run a 48-kilometer race, they would just collapse, um, and you go and win it, which is kind of mad. I presume, like, at, at some stage, um, parents or friends, or I don't know if you have siblings or whatever, they kind of say, look, Hillary, this was fun and you had a, you know, you, you had a nice time and you're a professional and that's more than most people will do. Uh, for the love of God, you're not going sky running ever again. Yeah. Like, they, it, you know, I get that you might want to, but really that would just be a stupid thing to do. So I presume yeah. those conversations happened. Uh, yeah, they definitely did. Um, <laughs> my mother, uh, for sure. She was like, Hillary, like, are you, are you sure? Like, this is the first race that you want to do. You don't want to start with like, a 10 K or yeah. something like this. Um, but yeah, so those conversations did happen, but also my mother knows that, and my, and my friends and my coach, they know that like, I'm a very stubborn person mm -hmm. and, um, like I, I have to, I have to do these things I set my mind to. So like they, although they were uh, like hesitant, uh, they were not surprised that like, this was the first race that I wanted to come back to. Yeah. <laughs> And then I guess to give the whole thing a bit of symmetry, uh, August just gone, you decide to return to Norway, return and do the Tromso Sky Race and, and kind of put that whole thing to bed. What was that like going back to scene of the crime? Oh, man. Um, it was probably one of the hardest experiences I've ever done in my entire life. Um, yeah, so I basically... I go there to see Manu. Um, I wanted him to show me um, the the ridge line again that I, that basically like, you know, I fell off of. So mm. he, he was there with me. My whole plan was to basically go there on the Wednesday before the race. The race was on Saturday, see the ridge, like confront the demon right there. Um, 
but like he and, and Mono and I hadn't even had a chance to even really talk about what had happened. So that was the first time when he gave me a play by play from his perspective of what happened in the accident. And then from there, um, like I saw the place. It was just like super eerie seeing like this, this place where I nearly died. Mm. And he um, like, I just, I wasn't crying. I wasn't upset, but I just like spent the rest of the day in silence. Like I honestly almost booked a flight home that day because I didn't think I could do it during the race. Like I was that scared and that terrified. Like my body was just telling me to like get the hell out. Oh. And, um, and, but like, honestly, then I actually did the vertical, the vertical kilometer race, um, the, the Thursday before. And actually that helped me kind of like get out the nerves. Cause then I was like, I have nothing to prove now. I actually got second in that race. So I was just mm. like, all right, sweet. I still got it. Like this <laughs> place is fine. Um, but then during the actual race itself, like I, the, like you have to cross this bridge when you go from Trumso and you enter into the trails. Mm. And I remember thinking in 2017 with the accident happened, I always think about like, Oh, the end of the race, like what is this going to feel like after I've like done this whole race and I'm like coming to the finish line, but I never got to experience that. But like the moment that morning when I started the race with Manu, like the, the agreement was we're going to run this, this 57 kilometer race together. And I like, I had no doubt in my mind that I was going to reach that, that bridge again. Mm. And, um, literally like when I, when I was on the ridge, like we were playing games, I was laughing. Um, but it was like the rest of the race where I kind of like cried and like, um, like was just, you know, on, on this emotional, like roller coaster because my body knew the last time I was in this place, like I nearly died. Mm. And that's something really hard to confront for like 10 hours, which is how long that, that race took. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's like a trauma, but the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so like, uh, amazing, really. Um, and, and that's a hell of a two years kind of boxed off, I suppose, in a sense. And did you like, do, do you need kind of counseling to get through something like that to get back going again? Like you talk about the fear or your body wanting to get the hell out of there. Yeah. Do, do you go in for any of that stuff? Uh, yes, yeah, so actually, it was really important to me, and a huge, a huge thing that I hel that helped me to get through my early recovery was um, writing, um, just like writing out my thoughts on paper. Mm. Um, and actually, I mean, I have a, I wrote a book, so in the, that two years, uh, so um, I'm, it's actually coming out this summer. But that kind of goes more into kind of the mental aspect of that. But um, yeah, absolutely. I actually saw like through the North Face, they offered. Um, you know who Conrad Anchor is? He's a no. insanely popular but yeah. he's a he's a mountaineer but he's on the north face team um basically he had this um this counselor that helped him kind of deal with there's a lot of loss that happens and people die in the mountains doing extreme things and so i talked to this man timothy tate he's a he's a counselor um just basically through what happened to me this physical trauma that and this emotional trauma and he helped me tease that apart so that i was actually ready to come back to competition okay. um which i think was really important uh, you, so, like running distances like fifty-seven k or sixty k or, or whatever, and plus you're thrown in thirty percent incline as well, and not smooth surfaces. Yeah. You know, people do a marathon and they talk about the wall. Like, uh, are you in absolute bits every time you do a sixty-kilometer race and go up mountains? Like, do you hit walls, or is your body now kind of used to it? Is it easy enough to get through? So no, actually, um, I so this vertical kilometer race, which is basically you climb um, a vertical kilometer, so like th a thousand meters in less than a five k. Yeah. That's when you feel like you're you're hitting a wall because you're you're like working so hard. But actually, in these ultras, um, no, they're interesting because you're not like starting out at this this pace which you're like you're red line right away because if you do that, you're gonna you're not gonna make it to the finish line. Um, so it's actually I feel it's like more it's like you certainly suffer. You go through like extreme ups and downs. There's like literally during every single ultra marathon race I've done, I've always questioned like, why the hell am I doing this? Like, this isn't fun. Mm. And then I usually like eat something like a piece of chocolate or like, and then it goes away. So like, it's, um, it's just different. You just kind of have to manage and problem solve your way through it. Mm. It's not always fun. It's not always glamorous. And, um, yeah, like probably at, at the end of a, of a race, I'm like, the only thing I want to do is just like finish this thing and like not run for a couple of days. Um, but the feeling always comes back because you just discover so much about yourself. It's like a journey. It's like a lifetime every time you like you do one of these races. And it's just it's it's beautiful. Yeah. And 
Yeah. There's a kind of there's a line I asked. I was quite. I think it's a great one. Um, Greg Leganis, the diver, said he always says sport is meditation in motion, and it strikes me that uh, sky running, ultra running on these kind of this kind of terrain must really be the case there because you know you talk about having to concentrate on all the different surfaces and and almost choose each footing, but then with the same token, I would say when you're going well and you're moving well and maybe going downhill or whatever. You can't consciously choose each step. There's almost an element of digesting the 20 meters in front of you and seeing, I'll put my foot yeah. there and I'll avoid that rock. And, and suddenly you probably get into this amazing Zen kind of rhythm, I'd say, when it's going well and you feel like, oh my God, I'm so good at this. Look at me just dodge all these rocks. <laughs> yeah, that's, you explained it perfectly um, because that's exactly what happens. And so you have these extreme moments of just flow and that you're, you're like, it's just you're just you feel like you're dancing across the trails but then sometimes in that same race it feels so difficult and, and but then I don't know I, I feel like you can't experience that zen unless you have the like the hard moments and yeah. and they each make each other they, they're complementary they each make, make each other like more special I think yeah. um so yeah I mean that's that's what I love about this sport and, and that's what like really motivated me to come back to it not just running, but also sky running. Um, because I feel like it's one of the few places where I can constantly learn about myself and become a better person. And then also just experience that, like that perfection, those moments of just complete Zen and flow. Mm. And also again, cause we can't underestimate it because you're all crazy. I mean, that's the, the underlying <laughs> point. Yeah, yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, we're all like, we all have bits of crazy. It I've sure just found do. a great way a unique way to express mine <laughs> yeah it's true so uh, how much longer are you going to keep doing the crazy thing then is this um i know you're in france at the moment is this next couple yeah. of years and beyond who knows each year as it comes yeah. or, or what's the plan yeah i mean i like to think it as, as long as i have like new and interesting projects and, and races to do and i'm motivated then i'm going to keep going for it um i'm also going to you know try to do as many different things as I as I possibly can while I have the opportunity. I mean, like I never thought I would write a book, so you know I did that. Um, yeah. <laughs> but also, just like there's there's so many different parts of the world that I'd like to visit, and I think one of my favorite ways to explore a new places is through running um, and movement. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna do that. Um, I mean, you mentioned that I'm crazy. I mean, actually, after all of these, like you know, being told I would never run again. This past year, I did my, it's called the TDS, Tour de Duc de Savoie. It's a very famous race um, in um, the week of UTMB, which is like a, a week of trail running, like a trail running festival in Chamonix um, in France. And it was the longest race I've ever done, ever, in my entire running career. So I was, that was pretty special that it was after nearly dying and being told I'd never run again. Um, mm. It was 145 kilometers. Wow. And it... Uh, gained 9,200 meters. Um, took me like 22 hours to do. <laughs> was, uh, yeah, it was pretty great. Battling, I got second. I was battling with the first place lady. But um, yeah, I mean, it's stuff like that. That it's just it's it's suffering, but it's fun. So mm. I'm gonna do it for as long as it's it's fun and it's interesting. And yeah, oh, that's amazing. I presume no one takes a <laughs> na- I, I presume no one takes a nap in the 22 hours just to. I mean, okay, uh, maybe the winners don't. Like, the people who are podiuming definitely don't nap. Um, But, yeah, there's other people in the race, like, that totally take a nap. Like, they have it. Like, they have the strategy down. Like, they can eat, like, full meals. They take a whole nap, wake up feeling new, (laughs) keep running. Yeah. God, amazing. So maybe ultra running isn't so far out of your wheel box. You well, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you could just, you know, bring snacks along the way. It's really fun. You no, should try it. The eating during a part I'm on board with. The rest I'm not so sure. <laughs> yeah, me too. It makes it, it makes it fun. <laughs> so listen, uh, it's great to talk to you. Amazing. And so best of luck with the book. I think that's out, is it next year? July, June territory? Yeah, it's out in July and it's okay. called Out and Back. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, people can Google, Google uh, Hillary Allen and find information on it, I'm sure. Listen, Hillary, yeah. amazing. Uh, so glad to see things turned out well. And thanks so much for giving us your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me.